Good evening, everyone. Welcome again to another program of To God Be the Glory. Again, we are here today by the mercies of God and the grace of God to proclaim that which God has written. What God has written is in the Bible. And on this program, we desire to proclaim that truth and be as faithful as we can, carefully, prayerfully, proclaiming the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have no desire to bring glory to myself. I have no desire to uplift myself. In fact, as I proclaim the truth of the gospel, I am in prayer that everything that I say and teach will be faithful to the scripture. We in our flesh, we, we, we can be prideful of things that we know about the Bible. We, we, we can be uh, uplifted and arrogant if we're not careful in prayer, asking God to uh, humble us down to where we ought to be, prostate, flat on our faces before holy God. This is the desire of the Bible teacher, a faithful one anyway. He doesn't want to bring any light to himself because he realizes that he's just a man. And, and, and if he's a messenger of the Bible, he's here to do one thing, and that is to tell the truth of the Bible. I don't want to twist any phrases to my glory. I don't want to uh, bring any attention to myself. No, please no. God, help me. This is my earnest prayer. Please help me as I do live in this flesh that, that, that pride will not come into me and, 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 and try to shed light to itself but that the Spirit of God may be within me to bring glory to our only Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And, and we are yet continuing our study in the book of Philippians chapter 3. And let us read that for a moment. Philippians chapter 3. And we've been talking about knowing God. And particularly in verse... Uh, Verse 10, but we'll begin reading in verse 9 again. And being found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And here it is in verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable, conformable unto his death. Uh, here, Paul, again, it, who is typified, who is a type. And if you can remember my last study, we were talking about types and figures and pictures. And this is how God reveals himself. Uh, spiritually, this is a spiritual book, and when we proclaim these truths, we, we, we take the first principle of Bible study where God commands any one of us who are teachers, written in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13, where he says we are to compare spiritual things with spiritual, comparing scripture with scripture. We take one verse of the Bible and we compare it with another verse of the Bible and allow God to interpret his own word. This is how we proclaim the truth of the gospel. It doesn't come out of the minds of men. And Paul, we were talking about the type and figures of, of Moses and Pharaoh down in Egypt, how Moses was a type of Christ and how uh, Pharaoh was a type of Satan and and and. and uh, the, the sea, both divided on both sides, uh, representing the gospel as a two-edged sword, a, a life 
unto life. It's a savor of life unto life. The Bible says in death unto death. And we saw how how Moses and the children of Israel went through on dry ground and the gospel saved them and brought salvation to them. And how the gospel also brought judgment upon Pharaoh and his and his uh, people, which are the unsaved of all the world, as well as the fallen angels. And Paul here is a type of believer. You know, we don't worship the men in the Bible, Paul. You know, you have people talk about St. Paul, St. Peter, and they look at these men as, they, as if they were something great. You know, there are no great men that has ever existed. The, the only great one we talk about is the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and Paul, who is a type of believer, talks about here in this verse, knowing God. And, and he talks about God in a way of knowing him that is real and, and authentic and right. And, and of course, we, we discovered in, in the Bible that uh, the one way of knowing Christ, the authentic way of knowing Christ, is through a personal experience with God. And, and this is the knowing that the Bible, as we compare spiritual with spiritual, gives us. Knowing God is knowing him by personal experience and, and the knowledge of God. It, it happens in the life of a person when that person is becoming saved at, at God's appointed time, of course. But this knowledge of God, uh, knowing God, begins with God, knowing us first. And it begins and originates in eternity past in the Godhead, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But yet there's one God the Bible talks about. And that, that is a mystery. That is a mystery. We find all kinds of uh, preachers and pastors trying to dissect God, the, the Godhead, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three distinct persons. But yet God would say there is one God. Listen, we're to stay in our place, pastors. And, and th this is why we're in this in, in this situation now, of course, where God's judgment has begun at the, the house of God that we read in first Peter chapter four, verse 17, and now has moved across to to this world. The whole world is under God's judgment in this day and time. And, and prayerfully, we'll get to that point where we're teaching those things that are true of God's judgment being upon the whole earth now. And, and this is why we see the division in the world. Uh, a, a, a kingdom divided amongst itself cannot stand. And this, is, this was Satan's world at one point, but now it's under God's judgment. But we'll move on to knowing God right now. And this, this knowing God begins in eternity past, wherein God foreknows or, or foreloved his people, all those who, who would become his bride his elect, his believers. And in fact, if we go to Romans chapter, chapter eight, if you will, Romans chapter eight and verse, I believe is verse 29. Actually, we'll go to verse 28. And this is one of the most popular verses that has been well known throughout the, the church age. Uh, and we know, verse 28, Romans 8 and 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Verse 29, for whom he did foreknow, here it is, the foreknowledge of God, foreknow, that I may know him that we're reading about in Philippians chapter 3, for whom he did foreknow, that same Greek word, gnosko, uh, but it's, it's, it's uh, pro-gnosko, uh, the foreknowledge of God. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So this, this, this foreknowledge of God is the forelove of God. Uh, uh, gnosko, uh, the, the, the intimate relationship between Christ and the believer, the, the, the 
for loving God. You, you know, God tells us in his word that, that, that we love him because he first loved us. You see, God loved you if you are a true believer and loved me in eternity past in the Godhead. And, and then it goes on to say he predestined us. You know, many people have a problem with being chosen by God. We, we want to be in control of God's salvation program. We want to make the choice when, when it's our when, on our time when we want to choose. OK, I'll choose you, God, to be my dad. That's not how it works in God's salvation program. It may make it may work like that in your mind and in, in which you've never become born again. But God's salvation program is in God's complete sovereign control. It's not in the hands of mankind. It's in God's providence is in his time wherein he would forelove you in eternity past before you even existed, before you was even thought of by your parents. And it says he predestinated it, which means this Greek word means to predetermine and, 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 and pre-establish. He pre-established his love for you and eternity past, and he marked it out beforehand. And in fact, if we go to Revelations chapter 13, Revelations chapter 13, if you will, beginning in verse eight, you know, God talks about people's names marked out or, or written or not written here in the Lamb's book of life. And he writes in verse eight of, of chapter 13 in Revelations, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the before the foundations of the world. And, 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 and you see, this is how God has planned his salvation program. But before he even created this world, he knew that mankind would, would fail. He knew that they would fall into sin and rebel against him. And he, ha he, had, a, he had a plan already pre-established for his elect people and those in whom he had already written their names in the Lamb's book of life. And, and we have discovered in the Bible that, that to know God and, 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 and to know him properly and to know him intimately is, is the work of God and the life of the believer. And, and, and we saw that the knowledge of God, to know God, gnosko, that Greek word, uh, we saw this, this, this same word in Luke chapter 1, verse 34, where the, the, the angel Gabriel came down from heaven to, to Galilee to tell Mary that she would be with child. And, and Mary, a virgin, said unto the angel, how will this be since I do not know a man? Same Greek word, gnosko. And we're talking about sexual intimacy here, you know, and, 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 and of course, we don't have that with God, but this is the intimacy that God talks about that he has with, the, with his bride, with, with the believer. And, and we also read, if you want to go back to the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, where, where God says, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain. Adam knew Eve, his wife. He knew her. You see, in this knowledge of God, that, that there is a, a, a love relationship, that there is an intimacy, there, there's an experience with God when you become born from above. And the knowledge of God is personal, and, and to know God is loving and an intimate relationship. And, and so Paul here in in this text, in Philippians chapter 3, came to understand. And when we talk about understanding spiritually, we, we need to look in the Bible and see what God talks about to, to, to understand, to see, to, to see with this, the eyes of our spiritual 
understanding in our hearts because before we become saved, our hearts are darkened. We, we don't know God. We, we have no knowledge. There's no spiritual intimacy with God. But once, and we find that in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18, but once we become born from above, once we have this spiritual knowledge of God, this intimacy, this relationship with God, this love relationship with God, God opens our eyes to see the beauty and the glories of Christ and, and see all of his wondrous works and, and, and who he is and what he has done. And, we, and if we go back to Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1, if you will, Beginning in verse 18, God talks about the eyes of your understanding. Our understanding is darkened by sin. So we can't understand how great God is. We can't understand the love of God. We can't understand the infinitely the infinite glories of Christ and, and his power and his majesty. We, we only see things on this earth because we're blind to the knowledge of God. But the eyes, God talks about. Uh, in verse 18 of Ephesians chapter 1, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is verse 19? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of of his mighty power, that ye may know what is the hope of your calling, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. This is what has to happen in the life of a person who is being born again. His eyes has to be open to understand, to, to, to see the intimacy that he has with his Savior now. So. It is the knowledge of God. And, and so Paul, in this text, he came to understand as his, as, 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 as his eyes were open after his encounter with the risen Christ on, on, his, on the road to Damascus. Uh, uh, Paul had his spiritual eyes open. He came to know Christ. And he came to know Christ because as as prior to him coming to the knowledge of Christ and prior to God and Christ meeting him coming down from glory and knocking him off of his high horse and, and, and blinding him and then opening and spiritualized to see how wondrous his grace was, Paul was dead. He was dead, and, and though he was around scriptures, and, 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 and he was around the Pharisees, and he had the Bible, he did not have salvation. He did not know the risen Christ. And after having this engagement of the love of Christ and the mercies of Christ, that, that he finally came to know Christ. As the text says in Philippians, that I may know him. You see, he had he had realized and had an, an encounter with the power of Christ in his life that opened his knowledge, that opened his understanding of the risen Christ. As the text goes on to say in verse three, verse uh, chapter three, verse ten in Philippians, in the power of his resurrection. You see, he encountered the risen Christ. And whenever you, if you are truly born again, if, if you had experienced this knowledge of God in your life, the love of God, if, if you have truly experienced the power of God's resurrection in your life, you have been raised from spiritual death to spiritual life. And, and you now have this beautiful relationship, this intimacy with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you have become a son of God. And, 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 and we read about that knowledge and coming to become sons of God. And if we go to John, the book of John, 
beginning in chapter 1, I believe it is. You know, God gives us the, the ability to become sons of God. We, we don't become sons on our own, by our own will or, or by our own desires at the time that we want to become a son of God. Now, God makes us his son. And we read about that here in John chapter 1, beginning in verse 12. Uh, but, as many as, but as many as received him, to them gave he peace power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now, you don't receive God and then you receive the power. No, you have been given the power. You see, we, we can, a lot of churches have read this out of context. Oh, you receive God and then you once, you, once you did something, then you receive the power to become. So no, let's finish reading the rest of this verse which were born, this is talking about the new birth, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Do you see that? Our new birth, our being resurrected from spiritual death to spiritual life, coming into the knowledge of Christ, is, is by the will of God. It, it is never by the will of man. You, you don't walk down an aisle like many preachers have said, walk down an aisle and receive Christ and you'll become the same. You, you don't become born again by the will of a pastor or a man telling you you're born again or telling you you're saved or raise your hand and repeat after me the sinner's prayer and so on, all this nonsense. No, you become born again by the will of God. We read it clearly right here in John chapter 1. And it goes on, if we, if we flip over even to, to the next chapter, next two chapters, chapter 3, where God has this encounter, Christ has this encounter with Nicodemus. If we go to chapter 3, beginning in verse Three, Jesus answered and said unto him, to Nicodemus, he's talking to, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And we just saw that seeing, seeing has to do with the, the, the sight of our spiritual understanding. Our spiritual understanding in Ephesians, if we go to, uh, to Ephesians chapter 4, and we didn't read that, but here it is in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. You see, blindness. The, 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 it's not talk, God is not talking about physical sight. He's talking about spiritual sight. Sight, spiritual understanding and, and uh, the, the heart being blinded from the love of God, which is the, the knowledge of God. And when we are blinded from the love of God and the knowledge of God, we have no sight. We, we, we have no sight of what real agape love truly is that comes from above. And, and most of the world and, and most people in the churches of the world, do not know Christ. Some profess they do, but do they really know him? For an example, if we go right in that back to that chapter, John chapter 1, verse 10 and 11, God says here, he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Same Greek word, the world knew him not. And this same idea, this same idea is found in other places of the Bible where the world knew him not. The fact is the world did not know Christ of that day when he walked up on this earth. And, and the Pharisees, they stood, who were the, the representation of the kingdom of God. They had the Bible, just like the churches of our day have the Bible. They stood eyeball to eyeball with Jesus Christ, but they did not know that he was God in the flesh. They couldn't see him. They couldn't see him. They were blind. They, they, they were blind. They had the scriptures, but they did not understand that Christ was the word of God himself. He was eternal God. And the church of our day does not know Christ. 
it means that, that there's a lack of intimacy. There's a lack of relationship between the people and God, the people of the world and God. And, and Christ is eternal God. This means that, that the world, in John chapter 1, verse 10, the world does not know its own creator, the, the one who made the world and made the people of the world. They do not know or have relationship with the creator, Christ. And of course, we understand the reason why. It goes all the way back to the fall in the garden. At the time that, that God had declared in the day that, that they ate of the fruit of the tree, that, that God put off limits, they would surely die. And they did eat disobeying God and died. That is, in their soul existence. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4, God tells us, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And God is spirit. And since man disobeyed, he died in his soul existence. God tells us in John chapter 4, verse 24, they that worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. And, and, and God is spirit. And that spiritual death that came upon man and that came upon all of us, it, it, it just made God unknowable to man in, in an intimate and, and personal, genuine and true way. Some of you might be saying, hold on. Now we have our religion. I'm a Baptist and I'm a Pentecostal or a Methodist or, or a Catholic. And, and, and much of the point of the religion is that we know God. And they, they, they say, come to us and we will show you him. We will reveal him to you. We will introduce you and teach you so that you can know God. And of course, that is why that that is what is said by the world and, and its religions. But that is not what God says about the world, nor about the religions. And, and we're just going to have to pick that up next time when we read in John chapter eight. And if you have your Bibles, go home and do a study on this. John chapter eight, beginning in verse 54 and 55, where God talks about this knowing him. And, and people professing to be Christians but not having true salvation or being born from above. Until next time, may God bless you richly and may the Lord keep you and you continue in his word. May God bless you and to God be the glory.